where the news is dark, but the newscaster shines bright like a diamond. I'm Anya Spintella. It's Thursday, February 23rd, and let's talk local headlines. Maricopa County Attorney Bill Montgomery says the recent Department of Homeland Security immigration order won't change how law, local law enforcement deals with immigration issues. Montgomery explained yesterday that the Sheriff's Office already has an arrangement with Immigration and Customs Enforcement to do immigration checks in jail, and he does not anticipate the arrangement will change. In fact, the county is still under the supervision of a federal court because of racial profiling charges against former sheriff and pink underwear fetishist Joe Arpaio and the city is no longer under the 287G plan, which deputized local police to enforce federal immigration laws. Under the provisions of SB 1070, which was struck down only in part by the state Supreme Court, the sheriff's office investigates a person's immigration status once they are placed in jail. This prevents local law enforcement from making the call to investigate, while 287G would leave the decision up to law enforcement officials. All of this means the racist SB 1070 law is preventing the even more racist Trump crackdown from taking place. You gotta love that. Montgomery questioned whether the federal government is obeying the laws of federalism, which gives states rights to determine how law enforcement resources are best used. He says that the law enforcement officials in Maricopa County are professionals and no order from DHS is going to change that. Unless, of course, Trump fires them all. And Maricopa County Sheriff Pen Paul Penzoni is still trying to figure out what to do with the famous tent cities set up by former sheriff and Steven Seagal superfan Joe Arpaio. Penzoni has put together a committee of 12 people to give him recommendations on what to do with the tent cities, which were used by Arpaio to house prison inmates and were condemned by Amnesty International. On summer days, the tents got up to 145 degrees and inmates often complained that their fans didn't work. Penzoni says the committee will review all of the data, tour the tent cities, and give him recommendations on what to do with them. One recommendation so far was to let Arpaio stay in the tents since he's been lurking around the sheriff's office in a confused, dementia-fueled state, claiming that he's looking for Obama's birth certificate. The TUSD governing board has delayed a vote that will determine whether or not Superintendent H.T. Sanchez will be fired. Discussions for the case cannot be made public while the decision is ongoing, but some hints have emerged. Board President Mike Hicks, who is aligned with board member Mark Stiegman, who is looking to get rid of Sanchez, says that he hopes the board will have a decision by next week. This indicates that Sanchez might be on his last legs. Newly elected board member Rachel Sedwick has publicly stated that she thinks Sanchez should be fired. But Sanchez supporters Adelita Grijalva and Cristel Foster have tried to rally support for Sanchez. The board will hold another meeting next Tuesday and may come to a decision then. Sanchez took over in 2013 after the sudden resignation of Paul Petticone, who quit with a year left on his contract. Since then, Sanchez has come under fire for issues related to budget shortages, declining enrollment, and the city's desegregation plan. Despite the controversies, there hasn't been a single scandal that would cause the board to fire him. The Arizona Senate has passed a law that requires doctors who perform abortions to try and revive the fetus if there are any signs of life and they, if they have the equipment to do so. Supporters of SB 1367 says that the law is needed to make sure that babies are given life-saving care. However, opponents say that fetuses can't be saved when abortions are legal. Supporters disagree, claiming that they've seen plenty of babies that were born after one month of pregnancy, such as, you know. The risk of the law is that doctors would be held legally liable if someone was to claim that a fetus could be saved even if there was no reason to save it in the first place. The Senate voted mostly along party lines, but with Democrat Kathleen Miranda joining 17 Republicans in voting for the bill. Twelve of the other Democrats voted against. Common Sense also voted against the bill. Arizona Representative Trent Franks has apparently seen way too many Michael Bay movies. On CNN yesterday, one of our state's many embarrassments said that there is a possibility that someone could smuggle in a nuclear weapon over the Mexican border inside of ba a bale of marijuana, and this is one reason why the border must be secured. Frank said that when, quote, we used to make the point that if someone had wanted to smuggle in a dangerous weapon, even a nuclear weapon, then we'll simply hide it, hide it in a bale of marijuana. He then remembered that the point was made in a Cheech and Chong movie. However, he forgot the fact that the marijuana would also need to be smuggled in and that nuclear warheads aren't made that small. Franks also made the same argument in 2012 House speech that he posted on his website. In the speech, Frank said, quote, specifically imagine the scenario of Hezbollah gaining possession to, of two nuclear warheads and bringing them in across the border in bales of marijuana. 
The story was later adapted into a screenplay, but this still waits in development after, until Franks can scrape together enough cash to hire Chuck Norris to play the lead role, Bent Tanks, a super handsome, lady-killing secret agent. The University of Arizona is launching a new initiative that seeks to expand access to high-quality care for the area's Latino population. The program is receiving nearly $2 million in grants over five years from the Merck Foundation Alliance to advance patient-centered care and seeks to improve the partnerships between primary care doctors and cancer specialists. The university also wants to develop oncology communication training for U of A medical students and others studying the health sciences. Arizona found itself in a town hall duel today as two different events were planned on the same day. A town hall in Arizona organized by Indivisible Southern Arizona and McSally Take a Stand originally invited Rep Representative Martha McSally to appear in order to hear concerns from her constituents. But McSally declined to attend, accusing the event of being a political sabotage. The claims come after two weeks of disastrous town halls that saw Republicans hearing from constituents angry about Trump's policies, especially the repeal of the Affordable Care Act. Then last weekend, McSally accepted an invitation to attend a town hall held earlier today in friendlier Sarita, which is apparently red enough for the rep's liking. Republicans don't seem to realize that they have to answer to people who don't agree with them in addition to supporters, a fact also not acknowledged by our tweet-happy president. The town hall in Tucson will still be held even though McSally won't appear. It starts at 5.30 p.m. and is at St. Francis in the Foothills Church at 46025 East River Road. If you leave now, you can get there in time and aim your criticism at McSally's empty seat. And I wanted to take to you, talk to you a moment about the program you're watching right now. Here at 5 on 20, we are undertaking a new kind of citizen journalism. We're going to give you the news as we see it, and we want more people to speak up with us. We need writers, hosts, anchors, camera people, sound people, the whole gamut. The times require a new way of informing ourselves. So join us. Do it. Do it now. Email us at info at creativetucson.org to get involved. And if you think there's a story we're missing, a person we should interview, an upcoming event we should cover, or have any news tips for us, shoot an email to info at creativetucson.org. We're here for you, and we want to cover all stories from all points of views. So don't be strangers. And now in international and national news. The Trump administration is reportedly planning to further dismantle climate directives established by President Obama. Two of the policies targeted are one that governed carbon dioxide under the Clean Power Plan and the other that seeks to control water pollution. Trump has vowed to get rid of the Clean Power Plan, which seeks to cut carbon dioxide levels to 32% below 2005 levels by 2030. Trump is also targeting the Waters of the U.S. rule, which defines various waterways that are subject to pollution regulation, which critics say are too strict because it includes dry creek beds and prairie wetlands, among others. Even though the rules are vulnerable, it would take years to completely get rid of them. So as a stroke of Trump's magic pen wouldn't be enough. The actions are expected to be delivered in conjunction with the, final, the first formal address by Scott Pruitt, the incoming director of the EPA. Pruitt has been shown to be close with U.S. energy companies when he was attorney general of Oklahoma. Yesterday, Pruitt was forced to release over 7,000 pages of emails that featured constant communication with local companies, such as Devon Energy. Pruitt helped these companies sue the EPA when he was attorney general, arguing that the Clean Power Plan overstepped its boundaries. Perhaps more embarrassing were a series of gushing emails sent to 90s pop superstar Lou Vega. The website military.com is reporting that various daycare programs for the members of the military are threatened because of the Trump's administration federal hiring freeze. At least two army bases in Kentucky and Germany announced that part and full day preschool and daycare programs would be canceled until further notice. A letter announcing the cancellations went viral yesterday, igniting anger that Trump's policies are hurting the very service members, members he claimed to want to help. A letter addressed to an army base in Wesbaden, Germany said that, quote, the closure is a result of a staff shortage due to the federal hiring freeze. But army officials say that the army's child care programs have had trouble with staff turn turnover and have had problems filling empty positions even before the freeze. There are about 12,000 current openings for military child care positions. Child care programs account for about half the Army's annual $1.1 billion budget for family programs. About 5,500 children are currently on wait lists for child care at 230 child, 230 child development centers. Army bases in Hawaii have the longest wait list at an average of 16 months. The Navy said that they weren't aware of any closings at child care facilities, while the Marine Corps and Air Force haven't yet released a statement on the matter. 
Trump declared the federal hiring freeze in his first few weeks of being president. It exempts positions related to national security and public safety, such as fire and police. Trump is considering a solution to the child care problem that would employ children six and under as junior ICE agents. The program can go into effect once the government is able to get enough pairs of tiny sunglasses and rainbow-colored tasers. Mexico is condemning a recently issued policy that would deport undocumented citizens and return them to Mexico, even if that isn't their native country. Mexican Foreign Minister Luis Vito Garay says that Mexico would not accept unilateral decisions imposed by one government on another. Homeland Security Chief John Kelly and Secretary of State Rex Tillerson will visit the country next week to try and smooth over the issue. But Vito Garay maintains that Mexico will never accept the order because it unfairly places a burden on the country and provides no resources to deal with the problem. He says that they will not hesitate to go to the United Nations to register to defend their rights under international law. The order was included in a memo released this week that drastically beefs up enforcement of people in the country illegally. Whereas under the Obama administration, only people who committed crimes would be deported, the order expands this to everyone who isn't a citizen, with the exception of DACA recipients. Many of those crossing the border come from Central American countries such as Guatemala, Guatemala El Salvador, and Honduras, so returning them to Mexico makes little sense. If Mexico refuses the offer, Trump's backup plan is delivered all captured migrants to Sweden by boat, disguised as a cruise ship. The Trump administration was on a roll yesterday, taking away human rights left and right. On Wednesday, they ended federal protections for transgender students that allowed them to use bathrooms of the gender in which they identify. Trump's team defended their position as a state's rights issue, erasing the federal guidelines passed down by the Obama administration. States will now be tasked to interpret the law and decide whether to allow students to use bathrooms of their expressed gender identity. I think we can all guess with 90% accuracy which states will allow it and which won't, so place your bets now. Education Secretary Betsy Davos, ever the paragon of tolerance, agreed with the ruling and thinks it's best left up to the states to decide. In a letter to U.S. schools, the Justice and Education Department said that the federal guidelines set them up for a series of lawsuits that apparently aren't important enough to fight. Thirteen states have already sued the federal government over the guidelines, starting with Texas, because it's Texas. Protesters crowded outside the White House with signs that said, respect existence or expect resistance. White House spokesman Sean Spicer says the president made the ruling because he has a long been a supporter of states' rights, except when it has to do with kicking out brown people. Next week, Trump will seek, seek a federal law that prohibits states from allowing Democrats to appear at Republican-hosted town halls. The Justice Department is trying to prevent a CIA official from being deposed in court or her role in the Bush-era torture program. CIA Dir Deputy Director Gina Haspel was expected to be disposed in lawsuits filed by psychologists James Mitchell and Bruce Jessen, who helped design the torture program, which caused massive criticism once it was re revealed. Mitchell and Jessen were sued by two men who were held at a detainee center overseas and subject to enhanced interrogation, a fancy term for torture. One other man died while detained, and his lawyer has also joined the lawsuit. Mitchell and Jessen claimed that they were only following government orders and should not be held liable. They asked that Haspel be disposed in court in order to testify on their behalf so that they can be exonerated. However, the Justice Department is looking to block her testimony under state secrets rules. Haspel, who was recently appointed by Donald Trump, reportedly helped another CIA deputy destroy 100 videotapes that showed evidence of torture at CIA black sites. Because of this, Democrats Ron Wyden and Mar Martin Henrich have called Haspel, quote, unsuitable for the position. This comes at a time when Trump has been weighing the option of restoring enhanced interrogations, which is now illegal. So it would appear that, according to Trump's plans, Haspel is completely qualified. She showed these qualifications at her confirmation hearing challenge. Haspel was handed a back scratcher, a jar of toothpicks, and a cattle de decapitation CD, and given 30 seconds to make an innocent Muslim man admit that he was the founder of Al-Qaeda. A Texas federal judge ruled that the state cannot cut off Medicaid funds for Planned Parenthood, at least until the lawsuits are settled. Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton says that he will appeal the decision, which he called disappointing. Texas sought to block the funds after a video was released purporting to show two people making a deal to buy human organs from aborted fetuses at a Planned Parenthood site. The video was later shown to be false. A lawsuit was filed against the video's creators for tampering with a government record and illegally offering to purchase human organs in one of the best instances of karma all year. 
However, the lawsuit was later dismissed on technical grounds, and the video's creators were recruited to direct Heaven is Real 2, Electric Jesus Boogaloo. In the decision, U.S. District Judge Sam Sparks said that blocking Medicaid funds to pa Planned Parenthood would disrupt the care of over 12,000 Texas Medicaid patients who receive services from the organization. Because of the ruling, Planned Parenthood will still be able to receive federal funding until the lawsuit is finished. Planned Parenthood said that about 75% of its $500 million in funding comes from Medicaid, which means that they likely wouldn't be able to continue to operate if, that, if they were denied the federal funding which is exactly the plan. Republican Tom Cotton proposed a new law yesterday that, that would divert these funds into feeding and clothing thousands of homeless fetuses. Trump's immigration crackdown might be terrorizing communities across the country, but it may also soon terrorize the housing market. Housing markets such as Miami, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and New York have some of the highest concentration of home buyers that are foreign born. Some fear that the crackdown will leave homes emptied and contribute to yet another housing bust like we saw in 2008. As domestic-born home ownership has decreased over the past five years, homeowners who were foreign-born increased slightly over that same period. This includes DACA recipients who were brought into the country as children but have fully integrated into American society. While DACA recipients are, for now, exempt from the crackdown, some fear that it will eventually be extended to include them. Alex Narashta, a policy analyst for the Libertarian Cato Institute, says that if Trump gets the immigration plan he wants, and the housing market will get hit harder than any other. He says that especially in urban areas, housing prices will see a deep decline. Some smaller mortgage companies give loan to undocumented citizens with highest interest rates. Some larger mortgage companies give loans to DACA recipients who can also qualify for a Fannie Mae loan. A third of the 11 million undocumented immigrants in the U.S. live in a home that they or a family member or friend own, according to the Migration Policy Institute, further adding to the problem. Some lenders, such as Las Vegas-based Altera Home Loans, who focus on mortgages for immigrants, are starting to worry about the new immigration policy. As immigrants fear an increase in crackdown, it's expected that they will cease to buy homes in the U.S., which will further depress the prices. But not to worry, because Vladimir Putin is coming to Trump's rescue again. Putin is urging Russians to invest in U.S. real estate after interest cooled when sanctions were placed on Russia for the invasion of Crimea. In 10 years, the average American home could look quite different, but at least we'll be able to get a good bowl of borscht for once. This was Anius Quintella for 5 on 20 News. Next up, Andrew Conlog explains it all, and then I'll be back to talk to you a little bit about local art. And on this segment, I explain all of it at least about some particular item in Tucson or Southern Arizona history. And then you know all of it and I know all of it and we have a little shared experience that we have. And today, as you probably can guess from the fact that I'm doing this segment, I'm a big history geek, especially Southwestern history. And in certain biographies and describing certain events, I'm gonna fanboy out pretty hard. And today probably is the time I'm gonna fanboy out hardest of all, so I'm just getting it out of the way because I'm gonna talk about Lozen. Lozen was a Chiricahua Apache woman, and the Chiricahua Apaches were the band that Cochise and Geronimo belonged to, and they were the most prominent band in the Apache Wars. Probably if you're picturing the Apache Wars, you're picturing a Chiricahua. And another prominent Chiricahua, not as well known as Cochise or Geronimo, was a gentleman named Victorio. He was a chief, and Lozen was his sister. And in addition to being that, Lozen was a very prominent warrior, kind of a right hand to Victorio. Victorio actually referred to her as his right hand. She was a counselor, she was a strategist, and was also a very powerful medicine woman. It was said that she had a power where if she prayed to the supreme deity of the Apaches, uh, who was called Yusen, she would be able to find the location of their enemy when they were in battle, which with the kind of warfare that Apaches did and the warfare that was in the desert at this time, it would be really important. She would pray and account say that she would get a sensation in her palms and that somehow translated to the location of these enemies, which, which is pretty cool. Anyway, um, Lozen was unique also because she never married. Now, for Apache women, it wasn't as weird if they were warriors or combatants, but it was usually accompanying their husbands, but Lozen didn't have a husband. And part of the reason for that uh, was that Chief Victorio kind of stuck up for her and said that she was too important in her role, so she didn't have to get married. 
He also said quite famously that Lozen was a shield to her people. That was sort of how she was known. And she had a very colorful career as a warrior, but the most prominent episode, I guess, would be in this uh, series of engagements in the Apache Wars that's referred to as Victorio's War, because Victorio was the leading antagonist to the United States and Mexico during this period. Basically, what precipitated that was that Victorio's band had come in willingly to a reservation that was called the San Carlos Reservation, or otherwise known throughout the Arizona Territory as Hell's 40 Acres. It's a really bad place. A lot of Apaches died there of disease and just was really terrible conditions. And so not surprisingly, Victorio led a breakout, or they jumped the reservation, as they said at that time, and thus began another phase of the Apache Wars. And Lozen participated very closely with Victorio during this time. But the coolest episode, probably apocryphal, or maybe all of it, at least definitely some of it's apocryphal because it's crazy. But anyway, this story goes around that while they were fleeing Americans and going into Mexico, and I guess also fleeing the Mexicans at the same time, uh, there was this Apache woman that was going to give birth, and Lozen stayed behind with her. Now, either it's not quite sure which one it was. Either they were purposefully wanting to take her back to the reservation because it was too dangerous out there, which shows you how dangerous it was out there because they wanted to take her back to Hell's 40 Acres with the baby. Or she was starting to have the baby, and Lozen was assigned to protect her, and then the Americans kind of cut them off from the rest of the people, and so they had to go back to the reservation. But the, anyway, the story was that Lozen has to take this new mother and this newborn baby back to the reservation through two countries, three states, Sonora, New Mexico, and Arizona, I guess four, including Chihuahua. And um, they were trying to get the, her back through these two hostile armies, which you manga fans will basically recognize it's kind of the plot of Lone Wolf and Cub. And it was equally awesome. There are all these crazy stories going around of Lozen protecting this baby. Like, there was this, they got hungry, uh, obviously, and Lozen came across this longhorn steer, but she was not afraid, because Lozen was never afraid. She was concerned that shooting it would alert people around, so she just killed it with a knife. She just went in and, like, stabbed this longhorn steer with a knife, which, those are giant, angry animals. That's amazing. And then, I guess they got thirsty after eating the steer meat, so Lozen also killed this calf, and cut out its stomach and made a little canteen out of its stomach. And you wonder why they didn't eat the calf, which is why some of this kind of might be some tall tales. But anyway, it's cool. Then, of course, they didn't have a horse. And Lozen, in addition to everything else, was an expert horse thief. So she came across this camp. And some people say it was just some Mexican cowboys, some vaqueros. Some people say it was Mexican soldiers. Some people say it was American soldiers. But anyway, basically, they all say that she just blitzed in there and stole a horse. Like, not even caring, just went in there. And, like, there were people shooting at her and stuff. She, like, matrixed her way out with the horse. It was awesome. And then, um, also, maybe in that episode, not sure if it was a different episode or not, Lozen also apparently stole a soldier's uniform, which is maybe my favorite, because I don't know exactly what she would use it for. Like, it's not a good disguise for her. She's an Apache woman, and they would recognize her. I just picture her wearing it for fun, because she's awesome. But anyway, Lozen and the baby and the mom all got back to the reservation eventually, which is where they learned that Victorio had been killed. And he had. He had been killed in a skirmish in Mexico by Mexican soldiers. And so Lozen jets out of there and again, all alone, crosses these four states and two countries while being pursued by these patrols and hooks up with the remainder of Victorio's band, which is now led by a guy named Nana, who was incidentally an 80-year-old man also an awesome guy. I might talk uh, about him at another point. But in retaliation for the killing of Victorio, basically, he leads this raid into New Mexico that's called Nana's Raid. And pound for pound, it's probably the bloodiest part of the Apache Wars. Maybe. Pre it's pretty close, anyway. Uh, because in a very short amount of time, they just killed like 45 guys, which was crazy. Anyway, when that's all over, eventually Lozen does get hooked up with Geronimo. And she is there till the bitter end, as was Geronimo. Geronimo was the last Native American leader, not just in the Apaches or in Arizona, but in the whole country to really surrender in force. And his surrender really marks the end of the Indian Wars in the United States. But what happened to him is he was on the reservation, and then he also broke out. People say that that was because he was concerned about a rumor going around that was maybe not totally unsubstantiated, that they were going to ship him and some other incorrigibles to Alcatraz 
that Alcatraz. And there's also an apocryphal story going around, maybe true, that Lozen was there at the time and that she just so happened to be on the reservation because she was trying to steal ammunition and maybe kind of gave him the idea, like, yeah, bust out. And so they did. Uh, lo what definitely was true that was that Lozen was there. She was kind of a go-between between the army and the last Apaches hiding out in the mountains in Mexico. That was also a traditional role of women as envoys, as ambassadors, and Lozen was the best, so they had her do it. Eventually that came to an end, I think as everyone, even the Apaches, knew it would at some point. What precipitated it was that the army threatened to ship their family to Florida, which is even worse then than it would be now. But they couldn't stand that, so they all came in. And as you might expect, they all got shipped to Florida anyway, including them. And that's where the only known photograph of Lozen comes from. Because Lozen, they all get on a train, and they stop in Texas on their way to Florida. And they all get out, and they all take this picture. And it's, it's interesting. You learn a lot about Lozen just from this one photograph. Because Geronimo is there front and center, he's the leader, and Lozen is right behind him, which analysts have said that indicates like the second position, that's the second in command. But she's also with all the women and children, which it really goes to who she was. She was a woman warrior. She was not a, a woman posing as a man and therefore taking on these manly roles of warrior. She was a fully realized warrior and a fully realized woman, and she was both of those things. What's cool about Lozen is that Lozen was really, at least it, it comes across to me, someone who knew who she was and just lived it. And by the sheer force of her abilities and her power, everyone else dealt with it, which was great. What's not so great, unfortunately, is, is her demise, her eventual death. She does go out to Florida, and then they eventually do move the Apaches to the Mount Vernon Barracks in Alabama, another Army installation. And the climate there is much different from the climate that's here. And as a result of that, Lozen gets tuberculosis, and she dies there. And that's where she's buried now, which is really kind of a sad ending to an otherwise really awesome life. Someone who I really picture in this Arizona and southwestern history as kind of an epic hero on the, the, the scale of like a Hercules or something in Greek mythology. So thanks, Lozen, for being awesome. And thank you for watching. I'll see you next time on Andrew Explains It All. What's up, Tucson? Welcome to Art Talk. I'm your host, Anais Quintella, here to get you out of your house and back into the loop with all of the local art and culture happenings the Old Pueblo has to offer. First on the agenda is tonight's handmade Tucson reception, put on by the Saguaro Market. Saguaro Market is a shop that specializes in the work of local artists and unique handmade goods uh, with a focus on letterpress, print, paper, and book arts. Tonight's reception will offer pe people a chance to connect with other local like-minded makers. You can learn more about Saguaro Market and how to become more involved before the upcoming range of pop-up markets they have planned throughout the next few months. The event will run tonight from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. at 657 West St. Mary's Road, and they will be offering refreshments. Also happening tonight is a drive-in screening of The Princess Bride at the Tango Verde Swap Meet. If you're like me, you clearly don't get to the swap meet enough and had absolutely no idea that there was still a drive-in theater in town, but tonight's your opportunity to change that, or not. Vendors for food, drinks, popcorn, and snacks will be on site, although there's no word yet if any of the said vendors will be offering beer. Tickets are $15 per car or $5 per person for a walk-in, or free if you have absolutely nothing better to do and feel like tuning in via radio at 103.1 FM. The screening will begin around 6.30. Tucson Improv Movement kicks off their Tucson Women's Comedy Festival tonight with events running through Saturday night. The festival includes stand-up comedians, improv groups, musical comedy groups, storytellers, and everything in between. In addition, they will also feature panel discussions and workshops. All shows are $5, and tickets or more information can be found at tucsonimprov.com slash TWCF. And tomorrow night, you can catch the Frida Kahlo Art Garden Life exhibit after hours in the beautifully lit Tucson Botanical Gardens. Alongside the exhibit, the after hours evenings offer farmer's market, food, drinks, live music, look-alike contests, flower crown making, and more. The event begins at 5 p.m. Reservations are not required and tickets are available on the door. On Sunday, La Cocina is hosting a celebration of Black History Month featuring stories of resistance and rebellion. Music and stories will be offered by Lando Chill, MC Salvador, Chance Freedom, New Tang Clan, Lola Rainey, our very own Zyra Olivier, and more. 
The event begins at 4 p.m. at La Cucina. Advance tickets are $5 or $10 at the door. Since their venue is only limited to 300 people, they are offering advance tickets through Eventbrite, and that link can be found on their Facebook page. If you're at least 21 years of age, be sure to catch FEMAF at Club Congress Sunday night starting at 8 p.m. FEMAF is a new series at Club Congress created for and by women right here in our community. Every Sunday, they'll be bringing you new creators, offering a wide range of creative happenings with a female focus. This night in particular will feature exhibitions from Melissa Andrews, Holly Hall, and Maria Bressler, poetry spoken and word performances by Charlie De Eve, Adriana Canoza, and Sophie Dawes, and musical performances by Sola Gazanka, Ditch Bank, Brittany Catter, Strict Witch, and more. Best of all, this event is totally free, so get out there and support some rad lady artists. And last but definitely not least, don't miss the Tucson Hip Hop Festival happening this Saturday. Starting at noon and ending at midnight, it's going to be a jam-packed day of Tucson's hottest hip hop acts, thought-provoking panels, good food, live graffiti art panels, and more. Some of the artists featured include MERS, Lando Chill, Jive and Scientist, Marley B, Cash Lansky, and Jock Zulu. You can catch my interview with the organizer and founder, Pike Romero, posted on creativetucson.org. This event is going to be an awesome showcasing of the diversity in Tucson through hip hop happenings right now. The festival will be a block party style event spread across five venues near the corner of Tool and 6th Avenue, such as 191 Tool, Exploded View, Studio One, Expanded Universe, and The Docks. Tickets are just $10 and can be purchased at the door or online at TucsonHipHopFestival.com. You might just spot me and some of the other lovely 5 on 20 crew members there doing our thing. Be sure to say what's up. That's what I've got for you today. Our city is definitely not lacking in creative happenings. Be sure to take advantage. This has been Ani Esquintella with Local Art Talk. Have a happy, have, have a happy Thurs Thursday, Tucson, and stay filthy.